glad and encourage you to keep your Bible on your lap. I want to turn to several passages uh, as well as get tie into this particular sermon. But most of them are in the Ian books. You know what the Ian books are? <coughs> Philippians and Corinthians and Colossians and, and, all, and all those. So they're all together. In, uh, <coughs> but most of them are together. All right, why don't you stand with me? <coughs> I'm just going to read the five verses from verse 12 down through verse 16. Where Paul is speaking. Well, let me go back and read verse 11. It ties it together. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lay in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Father, I pray now that you help me to make the sense of these verses and that people would get a grip and an understanding of your plan to build the church. And as we think about the day which we're living, it has been a challenge for every pastor that has tried to grow the church both spiritually and numerically. This passage obviously is more concerned about spiritual maturity growth than anything. Lord, I pray you use it to help us get a vision for the church, even in the days and age in which we live. And I'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. By the way, my wife and I were talking about something the other day, and uh, it was yesterday, actually. And I don't remember how we got onto the subject, but she said, you know, maybe, maybe we should have church at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings instead of 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Because 10 o'clock is Sunday school time anyway, which everybody... Okay, I have a question. You don't have to answer. Why would you get dressed up for church and only come at 11 o'clock as opposed to both hours? It just doesn't make any sense. If you're going to go through the trouble to look good, you might as well take advantage of it and come to Sunday school at 10 and church at 11, right? Or for some of you, you do it at the 8.30 thing anyway. But uh, then you'd have an extra hour in the afternoon to your family. How many would be in favor of having church? 10 as opposed to 11. Uh, all right, put your How many would be in favor? Man, that's just all for me. Uh, how many would be in favor of at, at 11 instead? Two, three. You guys like to sleep in. Jamie's one of them. You notice that? As the summer goes on, she sleeps. Put, put your hand down. You can put, as the summer goes on, she sleeps later and later and later. And I won't say that that's a bad thing. But that's what she does. So we'll get that in a minute. Anyway, we may do that. I know there's three or four of you who have to get out of bed a little bit, but most seem to be would rather do 10 o'clock. So that means when we go back to Sunday school, then everybody would come to Sunday school and church at 11. Is that what that means? Amen. I thought that's what that meant. Anyhow, let's get back to our message this morning. We may, we'll let you know about in advance before we do that, if we do that. These verses that I read to you in Ephesians chapter 4 give us God's plan to build the church. Jesus said... I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, there are all kinds of church growth plans out there. If I wanted to find a plan or a program that says this is the way to build the church, I could fill my library up with stuff. But all of those plans and all of those programs must follow this plan because this is God's plan. This is the way God would have desired the church to be. Now, we have a lot of different programs in our church. I won't even begin to list all of them. But all of those things are designed to build the church spiritually and numerically and for the glory of God. And I like to look at a lot of the things that we do. Those are just tools to build God's kingdom. Now, we ended last week and we were in verse 11 noticing that God gives spiritual, gives spiritual gifts to the church. And it included every individual in the church and every believer as well as gifted men that are listed in verse 11. It is God's plan, so let me read verse 11 again before I get into, back to our new message. 
He gave some apostles and some prophets. We don't have those today. They were for the apostolic age. There are no longer apostles or prophets who actually tell what's going to happen in the future. We have a lot to try to tell us what's going to happen in the future, but we don't have prophets like Isaiah, Daniel, uh, Ezekiel, those type of prophets. But we do have the gift of prophecy as far as telling forth the Word of God. So those two are gone, but then he said, and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, those two are left for the church to continue. And he told us why. So we've got these gifted men, and uh, it's God's plan that the last two groups, the evangelist and the pastor teacher, it is God's plan that those two continue the work of God building his church. And uh, here's God's plan. He begins in verse 12. Now look at it. For the perfecting of the saints, there's one thing. For the work of the ministry, there's a second thing. And for the edifying of the body of Christ, that's a third thing. So if there are three things in that, and I want to look at those. These are the goal of the pastor, the goal of all the leaders within the church. First of all, the leader is to perfect the saint. For the perfecting of the saints, and let me say this now so I don't miss it later. I try to teach you the Word of God, or as I pray, to make the sense of the Word of God, but I can't perfect you. God only can perfect you. So one day, Pastor, while I'm here on earth, am I going to be sinlessly perfect? No. It's not going to happen. You should strive for it. You should strive for holiness. We just sang holy, holy, holy. We ought to strive for holiness. The Bible says, be ye holy as I am. What a strive for that. But here on earth, we'll never be perfect. So what's he talking about when he says, for the perfecting of the saints? That talks about the equipping of the saints. We try to equip you, and the primary place is that is done, it is done from the pulpit. Now, these are for, notice it said in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. So these are for the believers. This is for the saint. This is for the child of God, and that's who it's for. These gifted, that are gifted in evangelism, or these evangelists, and some of you have the gift of evangelism, you bring people, men and women, boys and girls, to Christ. We all should be involved in that to some degree or another. They understand the gospel. They receive Jesus at salvation. We ex try to lead them to accept Jesus as Savior, and thereby they become part of the spiritual family of God, and they become citizens of another country. Now, that's where we start. We start by trying to win people to Jesus. Then the object, after that happens, is to establish a local church. That's what missionaries primarily try to do. Now, we already have a church established here. But there's places where there are no churches that are established. They try to win people to Christ. That's called mission work, by the way. And you ought to all be involved in that. But they win people to Christ, and then they establish a church. And that begins this equipping process that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. So we get saved and we plug into a good Bible-believing church. Then the objective after that is the people instructs people to take on the likeness of Christ by teaching them the Word of God and stressing obedience to God's Word and to provide a pattern of godliness the pastor should do that himself. So, Paul said, and I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. <clears throat> Paul said in 2 Corinthians, don't turn here, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, I believe. He said, finally, brethren, farewell. Then he said, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and God of the God of love uh, and peace shall be with you. Now you're there in Hebrews chapter 13. I want you to look at verses 20 and 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. That's talking about spiritual maturity. Working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, all believers are to be equipped, and all believers are being to be equipped to serve the Lord Jesus. Most of that happens at the church. 
by your faithful attendance Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, as people faithfully and consistently attend the Church of God. There are actually four basic tools for spiritual equipping that we have. First of all, and most important, I'm going to see if you know this. This is obvious. What is the number one thing that God uses to equip you? Word of God. The Word of God. Someone else said the Bible. That's number one. That's number one on purpose. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Many of you know these verses, but I'm going to read them anyway. Most of you can quote verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But notice what it's profitable for. That the man of God may be perfect, that is mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The most important thing, the first purpose of the pastor, he feeds himself, then he feeds the people, and he tries to lead the people to follow and obey the word of God. The next tool that God uses then is prayer. Look at Colossians chapter 4. Verse 12 and 13. <clears throat> that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, that ye may have lack of nothing. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. That's not even the book of Father. But did I tell you to turn to Colossians 4? You know, many who recognized where I was? First Thessalonians. Don't ask me how I did that. I do things I have no how. I do that. Anyway, verse 12. A papyrus, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. We labor fervently for you in prayer. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Above everything that we pray, or at least me, that I pray for the church, it is your spiritual well-being. That you would be rooted and grounded in the truth. That you would grow and be established in the things of the Lord. Verse 13. For I bear him record that he may have a great zeal for you, and them that are at Laodicea, and them that are at that other place there as well. So we give you the word of God. We pray for you. The third and fourth tool we hope the pastor does it too. The third tool that God uses to equip you is this, testing. Now, I, we live in a, uh, a day and age of coronavirus and this pandemic, and we had a prayer request with that this morning. And by the way, I should have mentioned a lady that my wife used to work with before she retired. She's got coronavirus now. I know quite a few people that have had this stupid disease. But anyway, she's got coronavirus now. And she's in New York City. She took a job down there, and it turned out to be not such a good move. But um, we pray. But listen, this has been a testing time for everybody. And we've seen the good come out of some people. And we've seen the bad come out of other people. God uses testings in our life. See, I don't like testings. They're for your good. They're for my good that God uses them. The fourth tool, hopefully the pastor doesn't create this one either, is suffering. I hope I don't create the suffering in anybody's life. But look at Philippians chapter 3. I'll reference this later, but I won't uh, read it twice. Philippians 3, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> and be found in him. Oh, and be found in Jesus. This is more than salvation, but it certainly starts there. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And then he says this that I may know him. Pastor, didn't Christ, Paul already know Christ? Yes, he did. But he said, oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his, what's the next word? <laughs> Suffering. Being made conformable unto his death. God uses testing and God uses suffering in my life and in your life. The test is to see how strong we are in the faith and sometimes we fail that test. The suffering God uses these things to more and more and more conform us into the image of his dear son. Now, he instructs people 
and, 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 and that God uses these other things. Wednesday night we've been studying the life of Jacob and I, I stopped last week and we introduced Joseph but then I go into the auditorium with the, with the past kids. But when you read from Genesis chapter 37, I think it is, to the end of the book of Genesis, and you read all of the bad things that happened in Joseph's life, and you know what Joseph said at the end? You guys meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God used all those things in Joseph's life. Now those are the two things, the suffering and testing, the two primary purging agents that God uses to refine us to greater holiness. Because God longs for us to walk in holiness. Turn over to the book of James, chapter 1. I told you that we would look at several passages. Verse 2. I can't wait too long because of this video. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. And then a blessing to count it all joy when you're tested. Not a lot of amens on that there. Look at verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, and it says worketh, it worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. And I'm going to be, uh, uh, I'll be a little transparent. I am not the most patient person in the world. In fact, I'm probably not even close to the most patient person in the world if you want to know the truth. And then he says, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So I'm a little immature in that area of this patient stuff. But I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I'm probably not the only one that's that way. God uses these things in our life. And when we respond to God's testing and trust to continued obedience, our spiritual muscles are strengthened. Just like when you go into a gym and you lift weights and you get strengthened. Uh, an effective service for him is broader. Suffering is also a means. Look at 1 Peter. You're, you're right there in James. Uh, look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. Suffering is also a means of spiritual equipment. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after he hath suffered a while, made you perfect, established, strengthened, and settled. God uses sufferings in our lives for his glory and our good. And Paul said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Turn to one other passage of scripture. Well, that's not true. I will take that one number one out of there. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I may not even get finished with this sermon this morning. But if we started at 10, it would give me an extra hour. No, no, no. <clears throat> Verse 4 and 5. I have these verses highlighted in my Bible. You may want to do the same. Who comfort us in all tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by that comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the suffering of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. When verse 4 really became a reality, reality to me, when Hal Roscoe's wife, he's a pastor friend out in Rochester, and I had lost, most of you know, my first wife to uh, cancer. His wife had exactly the same cancer. I mean, it was the same, it was deja vu, it was the exact same scenario. He called me up, or I called him up at least once a week, and definitely never any more than two weeks apart. And, I, and now you know what he calls me? his coach. I kind of walked in through, because it was amazing how identical the steps were. Sometimes God allows a test or a trial or a something to come, to come into your life, so you're going to be able to use it somewhere else down the road to help somebody else. Now God uses these things to grow the saints. They didn't say they're good things. The Bible says all things work together for good, but it doesn't say all these things are good things. God allows them Sometimes God may even cause them at times, according to his sovereign will, but always they are for your good. So the first two, the equipping, the teaching, and all of that, they are for the gifted man. Look at Acts chapter 6. One last passage here in this section, and we'll turn two last. I better quit saying that. What is the pastor's 
primary responsibility then. Acts 6 and verse 4 will sum it up. But we will give ourselves, <clears throat> they're choosing deacons here. We will give ourselves a continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The pastor does that. He is told in 2 Timothy chapter 4 to preach the word. To be instant in season and out of season. We are to preach, we are to teach. Administration and structure and all of that stuff, they have their places in some of these programs that people come up with, they're fine, there's nothing wrong with them necessarily. But as far from the heart of spiritual church growth, it has got to be through the word of God and through prayer. And the, the great need of the church has always been spiritual maturity rather than organized restructuring. One guy that I read from some years ago, he said this, when our church is in a hard time, this is what we decide to do. We add a staff member. Adding a staff member never fixes any problems. We don't need, by the way, let me say this, we don't need to be entertained either. Some of these churches, the modern churches today, you go in, they have a 40 minutes to an hour of singing. They have a 10 or 15 minute sermon, and that, or sermon that you might even want to call it. And then that's the end of it. I'm for worshiping God in the song, but this is what's most important in the church service. It is the Word of God. Yeah. The pastor has a difficult time doing all kinds of different things uh, if, he's in try if he's always spending his time trying to develop new programs. He is to be studying the Word of God and praying. And I don't really try to entertain you when you come to church. When it happens, when you laugh, it's usually an accident, not on purpose, okay? What destroys people? Think of Hosea, if you know the verse. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. My people are destroyed because of a what? A lack of knowledge. And it's a lack of knowledge of what? The Word of God. We need the Word of God. The first concern of the church is not the empty seats. The first concern of the church is the filled seats. For you to grow in the Lord. Now the great truths of the Word of God can never be mastered. They can never be overlearned. If uh, it, sometimes we have to be reminded, and it's necessary for constant and consistent feeding of the Word of God. Look, if you would, please, with me back in Second to Peter chapter one. <clears throat> Verse 12. Wherefore, I will not neglect to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye knew them, I know them, and be established in the present truth. But if you're still going to hear the same things over and over many times. <clears throat> Yea, I think it mean, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, uh, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Well, I'm not planning on dying anytime soon there. That word deceased just kind of crossed my mind. But it is to give you the same thing oftentimes over and over and over again so you faithfully do the things that God wants you to do. The great truths of the Word of God. Now the pastor equips the saints on the earth. The ministry of equipping is the work of, of, of leading Christians from their sin to obedience in the things of the Lord. Now let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4. And I put a ribbon there. <clears throat> now let's see. We were in verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. That was all on the perfecting of the saints. And then it says this, secondly. For the work of the ministry. But what do you think the work of the ministry is? It's service. It's serving the Lord. The second part of God's plan for the operation of his church is service. And how many people should really be involved in the service of the church? Good answer. All. Everybody. We all should be involved in the service. The wording here suggests that it's not just the responsibility of the leaders to do the work of the ministry. No pastor. Some churches are large. They have several pastors. 
But uh, <clears throat> even that, they could never do the entire work. Look at verse 16. From, where, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body and the edifying of itself in love. So leaders serve in many ways. Uh, there's not one thing here in the church that I would ask you to do if I didn't do it myself. Several in our congregation share in equipping. I'm not the only one that helps equip. There's other teachers here. But God's basic plan is the equipping. It's done so the saints can serve each other effectively. The entire church is to be aggressively involved in the work of the Lord. Paul ended 1 Corinthians. He said, uh, Oh, what did he say? Finally, my brother, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We are to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. And so when gifted men are faithful in prayer and they are faithful in uh, sermon preparation and teaching the word of God, the people get equipped and they are rightly motivated to do the work of the service of the Lord. I've always said that one of my weak points, but I'm not sure it's my job. I think it's the spirit of God's job is to motivate people. Your responsibility is to be obedient. So then from these equipped saints, from the equipped saints, God raises up pastors, deacons, other teachers, and every other kind of work that needs to be done in the church. God raises them up from within the body. Spiritual service is the work of every Christian. It's the work of every saint of God. And uh, listen, you say, well, I go to church. You know, that's not enough. You should go to church as often as you can. And beyond that, you should be serving the Lord in a particular area of some kind of the ministry. Now, let's look a little further in this verse. So we've got the perfecting of the saints and the maturing of the change, not saints, so that they can get involved in the work of the ministry so they can thirdly do the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, that's an immediate goal of God's plan. Then it said in verse 14 and 15, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro because you're sound in doctrine and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth of love may grow up unto him in all things which is head, even Christ. Now, we are to get rooted and grounded in the truth Proper equipping by evangelists and pastors leads to proper service, which results in the, the building up of the body of Christ. And the emphasis in this particular section is on spiritual edification and on spiritual development of the churches. Paul speaking here to the church about building them up internally. That's why I said we are more concerned with those of you that are in the seats than we are the empty seats. Although we want to see people get saved so they fill the empty seats. Paul exhorted the Ephesian elders. He said, And brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all men which are sanctified. The maturity of the church is tied to the learning of and to the obedience of the word of God. Every person here ought to be maturing. Every person here ought to be growing. You ought to ask yourself this question. What area in my life am I maturing right now? What area in my spiritual life am I maturing right now? What area in my life is God growing me through the Word of God as I'm obedient to it right now? What area in my life do I see sin in my life like I've never seen it before and I need to get it straightened out? You see, here's the way it works. The more Word you get in you, the better off you're going to be. The goal of the leaders, perfect the saints, get them equipped in the, in the knowledge of the Word of God. Why? For the work of the ministry, so you serve the Lord, and then to edify or to build up, and of course we do it through the Word of Prayer. Then, I already read just a moment ago, well, what's the purpose of this plan? Well, there's several things that are listed. Um, it's for the church on earth. Verse 13 begins another list. Till we all come into the unity of the faith. The first one is the unity of faith. Here also, if you turn back, uh, I believe, to verse 3, or verse 13, what is it? Maybe even chapter 1. Anyhow, God is, I didn't know what he said, but whatever verse he said, look there and read it. Verse 13. 
Uh, God is interested in unity in the church. There's a pastor. He's preached here. Most of you would know him. He resides in this church now. He pastored out in Rochester. And uh, we were talking one day. And uh, we were talking about church and staff and all that. And, he's, and, and I chuckled. I don't want to tell you his name because he'll probably preach here again. But uh, he said, when I was pastor, he goes, I spent most of my time as a referee. I said, What's, what do you mean? He said, I had all these type A guys on my staff. Well, the type A people, you know, I'm right and you're wrong. It's all our stuff. That's the way we are. And so we have to kind of take, take with that, temp temper that. So he said, because I have a church full of type A guys on my staff, I'm alive and half of my time is spent refereeing. Well, that's not really God's plan. The, the pastor spends half of his time refereeing people, especially on staff, I would like to think. That's what this brother was saying. I almost said his name. Faith here in verse 5 isn't just saving faith. It's the entire body of faith, not just saving faith. It's those, some, some people just have strong faith. I will remind you that there is a, there's a line, a, a fine line between faith and foolishness. Don't be foolish, but you got to have strong faith. The unity is the ultimate target of the church, but we still deal with this old nature. And so because we still deal, still deal with this old nature, sometimes unity can come difficult. But the unity is the ultimate target of the church. But we still deal with this. But the more mature in faith we become, the better we are taught, the more obedient to the word of God we are. We do the work of the service and ministry. The church edifies, that has built itself up. You know what we can do? We can hit the target. That's not just true in the church, that's true in families as well. Then he gives another one there, verse, whoever I was reading, verse 13. The knowledge of the Son of God. Listen, you need to learn more and more and more and more and more about Jesus. You just do. I just do. It's more than salvation. Paul was a saved man. And we already read it, but he said in Philippians chapter 3, that I might know him. And the power of his resurrection be made conformable unto his death. Wouldn't it in suffering? Wouldn't you just like to know Jesus just a little bit better? That ought to be the goal of every single person here, just to know Jesus a little bit better. He prayed that he'd have a deeper knowledge of him. He might long to know him. Oh God, I pray you give us that same burden. And then he said this, unto a perfect man, that's the mature man. When? Now look at the end of verse 13. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God's desire for this church is that every believer, every one of us, become just like His Son. That's God's will. We are to manifest the character qualities of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to radiate and reflect God's maturity, God's perfection. We are to walk like he walked in complete obedience to the Father. The Son always did the will of the Father. We want, we won't in this life attain sinless perfection, but we strive for it, and we are to keep growing and maturing. That's God's will for your, say, what's God's will for your life? Well, that's one of them. Then he said in verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men coming craft in us. We are to be we're to have sound doctrine. As we follow God's pattern, we get to learn sound doctrine. That's what's wrong with this ecumenical movement. I, uh, I don't want to chase the rabbit on politics, but you've heard us say before, you'll hear us say again, there is coming a one world religion. And then you have a picture recently of the Pope and Iman, the Pope's in the middle, the Iman and a rabbi on the right. You ever think about that? So their doctrine couldn't be more different. The Pope says he believes in Jesus as the Messiah. Whether he does or not is questionable, but that's what, it, that's what he says he believes, right? Does the Muslim believe that? Does a rabbi believe that? No. The rabbi believes in the law of Moses. The Muslim believes in Muhammad and Allah. The, 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 we'll say the, the 
the Pope, well, I was going to say Christian, but the Christian organization represented by the Pope says we believe in Jesus and his resurrection. You're not even close in doctrine. You are light years apart in doctrine. And yet they can come together and throw doctrine aside so everybody can all get along. While we strive for unity in the church, it has to be doctrinally sound with unity. The immature believers are gullible because they don't know things, they don't study things, they need to be taught. They're in a, in a, in a place where the devil sometimes can get a hold of them. I remember when I was a young Christian, I was one of the very first people I ever witnessed to. And she gave me a Bible. It was uh, good news for modern monkeys, or good news, whatever it's called. Anyway. She gave me this Bible. And uh, so I came back to the church, and I was telling the pastor's wife at that time, Mrs. Hall, and uh, I said, I was a witness to this lady, and look at this, she gave me this Bible. I was all excited about this Bible. She looks at it, and she goes, oh my. And I thought, huh, what's she talking about, oh my? And listen, some of you won't know what I'm about to say anyway. I didn't know anything about what Scott worked. I didn't know anything about textual manuscript evidence and all of that. I didn't know any of that stuff. And I thought that was just a wonderful thing that this lady gave me this. And I'm sure she meant well. Okay? She meant well. But uh, <laughs> I can still see Mrs. Hall. Oh my. I can still see it in my mind. There are some Bibles that aren't so good. You know that, right? That's why we stick to what we stick to. Anyway. Immature Christians have to be taught just like I did. Doctrine is critical. Never, if you move away, never attend a church that is not sound in doctrine. It makes, it makes an emphasis on doctrine. Here's a thought for you. Right thinking leads to right living. There's another one. Let's see where we can find it. Uh, Till we all come into the union, to the stand of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. I read that verse already. But speaking the truth in love, a true love. Now listen, this is for the saved, but it's also applicable to the lost. A spiritually mature church that is equipped, that is sound in doctrine, that is mature in their thinking and living, is a church that will reach out in love to proclaim the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll reach out to the lost. Uh, where do evangelists come from? They come from the body. God gives us knowledge, understanding. He gives us gifts and maturity, not to keep, but to share. He equips us to serve, not to stagnate. You know, you've got to be careful you don't let yourself stagnate in the things of God. We are gifted. We aren't gifted in, in edified in order to be complacent, to be self-satisfied, to say I've arrived, but in order to do the Lord's work in the service and building up and expanding the body of Christ. And it says, in love. In love is the attitude by which we evangelize. It's the attitude we have in which we share the gospel. It's the attitude that we have as we try to encourage the saints. We do it in love. What's our philosophy here, by the way? We win them, we teach them, we train them, and we send them. And then what do we do? Well, we win them, and we teach them, and we train them, and we send them. And then what, Pastor? Well, we win them, and we teach them, and we train them, and we send them. You got that all figured out? That's the ministry. The combination of truth and love contracts contrast two great threats to the, a powerful ministry. The lack of truth and the lack of love. We are to be people that have truth, but also love. We can't be obnoxious. We grow up in all things, it says in verse 15. Jesus is the head of the church, you can read it, which indicates his authority, his leadership, his controlling power, to grow us in his likeness, to be completely subject to his controlling power, and obedient to his will, and in obedience to his word. That's what God wants. Then I'm going to try to finish here quickly. Let me read verse 16 one more time. For whom the whole body fitly joined together, now, so this will say the church that Paul's picturing here in our minds is a church that's well fed, it's well taught, they're serving God, they're equipped, they're getting out there. For whom the whole body fitly joined together and packed, compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. 
maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Somebody said this. Christ holds the body together and he makes it function. The joints are points of contrast. The joining together of union where the spiritual supply, resource, and gifts of the Holy Spirit pass from one member to, member to another, which provides the flow of ministry and it produces growth. And do you see some of the phrases like the whole body? And like it says, every joint. What does that mean? Just what it says. Every joint. The whole body. All of us. All work together and serve the Lord together. Lee Robertson was a pastor and he's passed away now. He preached until his 90s though. And uh, he passed away. He had uh, pastored Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I believe. And he made this statement one day at a sort of Lord conference. He said, I think 90% of my church is lost. Well, I'm thinking, well, Dr. Robertson, some of you have probably read his sermon if you read a sort of Lord. 90%, that's a scary number, isn't it? Amen. But he said, because only 10% of them are involved in ministry. Well, we have a higher than 10%, but we don't have 100%. But we ought to have 100%. Every joint, the whole body. Church growth is not a result of clever methods, but every member of the body using their personal gifts and their personal talents for the glory of God. Jesus is the source of the life. He's the source of the power. He brings the growth to the church. We take no credit for anything. But the fact of the matter is, God works through people. The power of the church flows from the Lord through individual believers and relationships as well through the believers. Now let me just say a few things. Where God's people are close to Jesus, where they have close relationships with each other, whether it is genuine spiritual maturity, and we're not perfect, and all of us have areas that we still need to grow in, myself included. God works where there are that way. But when people are not well grounded, where there is no love, where there is no close relationship with the Lord, where they are not faithfully using their gifts, and where they are not faithfully using their talents, God doesn't work. God has chosen to use you, and you, and you, and you. That's, that's his plan for you. Every believer is to be close to Jesus and serving the Lord. Faithfully using your spiritual gifts in close contrast, uh, close contract with every other believer. Now, can I just say something? Have you noticed, that some of you have been here for every service that we've started when we went through the book of Ephesians. This is why we do expository teaching and preaching. You notice how this whole book is in flow and content, context, the whole thing. Paul started out sharing spiritual blessings with us. He gets to chapter 2 and he talks about salvation, where you were dead in trespasses and sins. And there may be some of you here this morning that are still dead in trespasses and sins. That is, you're lost and you're without Christ, without Savior. Then he begins to talk about the church and he begins to talk about gifts. How he's given us gifted men and then how he's gifted us. You all have gifts. And now he's saying, now you're in the church and you, now you've got these gifts, you know what they are. Now use them for the glory of God. It just goes through your whole Christian life, this whole book. And then he'll talk about more practical things here as we move along here a little bit further. Now, God looks for willing, loving, obedience. The physical body operates best when all the parts work in unison and when they respond to the head. The church does the same thing. The eye, the key to all of this is every believer needs to stay close to the Lord. Faithfully using your gifts. Now let me ask you a few, few questions I want to close. Are you growing in the Lord? I mean right now where you sit there are you maturing in the Lord? Are you or are we operating in love? Trying to edify and encourage and build one another up? 
Are you using your gifts and your talents for the glory of God? Why don't you sit back and say, well, I come to church, that's enough. It really isn't enough. Are you obedient to know truth? That when God reveals truth to you, you're obedient. And are you consistently, faithfully, studying, reading the Word of God, and are you under the ministry of the Word of God? Let me just say something. There's an awful lot of truth in those five verses, and you ought to meditate on those things. But what part do you have in helping build the church? What part do you have right now helping build the church? Not, not yesterday, not, you know, well, I used to do it. That's not what I'm asking you. You got stagnant if it's what I used to do. That's not God, the God's desire to get stagnant. You are to use your gifts. You are to use your talents to build the church. So you get equipped. Equipped doesn't happen overnight, by the way. That's why we disciple people and try to help encourage them. to get So you can serve and you are edified and built up in the faith. And you know what that does? It just happens over and over and over. We win them, we teach them, we train them, we send them. That's the philosophy of the ministry. Now let's have every head bowed and every eye closed and faith will make a way to the end. Uh, this message was directed directly to the church. 100%. I said, gifts, talents. If you sing, sing for the glory of God. If you play an instrument, play that instrument for the glory of God. If you are gifted to teach, teach for the glory of God. If you're gifted to serve in things that perhaps are behind the scenes that people never see, serve for the glory. Do it as unto the Lord and not unto man. Do it for the glory of God. And what sort of the hand find you to do it? Do it with all your might. Your question to the church is you simply need to ask yourself, what part am I having right now in the building up of the church? But maybe you're not a saint. You started out in the second verse we read with the word saints. Maybe you're not a saint individual. Maybe you have no clue what it means to be a born again child of God. We would love to have the opportunity to tell you how this morning. If you're not 100% sure your sins have been washed away in the blood of the Lamb, which we sang about it here, we can show you, and I would encourage you to come. I would encourage you, encourage you that I want to watch this broadcast. Uh, if you would call the church or email the church, there's a click link you can turn it on there and get a hold of us. What do you do for the glory of God? Our Father, as we meditate on these verses of Scripture, I trust that the Spirit of God will help people make the sense as I've tried to prepare and get ready. But I have human limitations, I admit. But Lord, I pray today that you have fed your people and that they would walk in love and you would use what we said for the glory of God. For those that are not serving, not using, not doing, not ministering. Lord, I pray you convict them about it. Maybe not witnessing, not sharing their faith. Maybe they're weak in the faith. I don't know. But Lord, grow in the Lord and convict them of their do nothing attitude and help them to be faithful in living, in serving you. And may every one of us be careful that if anything good happens in our lives, that we remember to say, praise the Lord, or thank you, Jesus. But not, I did it. It is a work of you. Paul said, you give the increase. And so as we meditate on these scriptures here in a moment, and we think about our own lives, not those around us, but our own lives, may the Spirit of God prompt and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.